when the Black Lives Matter protests happened, and I started to learn so late in my life about the systemic oppression of people of color in the United States, I felt ashamed. I felt ashamed that I didn't know more about it. I felt blindsided by the intense racial disparity people of color endure every day, all the time. I learned about things like the dismantling of Black Wall Street, the seizing of black property without calls, cause, the Tulsa massacre, which, by the way, I learned about when viewing the HBO show Watchmen. I thought it was an alternative history when they presented it in the show. And then I Googled it, and uh, it was unfortunately true. <clears throat> With this newfound perspective, I started to see the adoption of my youngest sister, Anne, through a totally different lens. Now, Anne is biracial, born from a white mom who was 16 at the time, and a black man. I likely would never have met her except that my parents belonged to a charismatic Catholic group in the 1970s. I was 13. My mom, born Catholic, converted my dad when they married, and then they found this movement of Catholics who were tired of the boring old traditions and dusty dogma of the church. They wanted something more spiritual, less religious, something edgy, something they embraced the real Jesus, the one we all had on our walls in those days, a kind-eyed hippie dude with a feathered Farrah Fawcett haircut and well-trimmed facial hair. <laughs> As part of this spiritual renewal, the members of my parents' Holy Spirit community had purchased houses in the same neighborhood, had prayer meetings at different houses weekly, and regularly did charity work, reaching out to foreign ministries to help starving kids in other countries or to support Catholic work, Catholic mission work. And all these good, white, middle-class Christians adopted biracial kids. Why? Well, these kids, neither black nor white, were considered difficult adoptions. White parents tended not to want mixed-race kids, and black parents often faced huge barriers to adoption in general. So the kids frequently languished in foster homes until they were 18. Now, my parents and their prayer group saw these adoptions as walking the walk. They wanted to help people in a real tangible way, not just talk about doing good works. As a young teenager, I wasn't that excited about another younger sister. I already had two sisters, and they were a pain in the neck. And one more kid meant sharing the little space we had in our house and possibly nixing the idea that I might finally get my own room. But as my parents said, we had plenty, we had room, and this three-year-old girl needed a place to live. They did not go looking for another kid. They were contacted by Catholic charities and specifically asked to adopt this seemingly unplaceable girl. Now, when we first met Anne, she was three. She lived in a foster home in a small town about an hour from where we lived. When we arrived at the house for the first time, a house crammed full of 10 other foster kids, she hid from us. When we did finally meet her, she seemed really sad. A little girl whose beautiful fine hair had been buzzed to an inch to keep it easier to brush wearing a red shirt two sizes too small that exposed her round belly. Her hazel eyes were distrustful. We wanted to talk to Anne and play with her, but she was totally silent. She'd learned not to talk too much and still carries a slight stutter when she's flustered. It seemed like it might not be a great idea, bringing in someone we didn't know from a place we'd barely seen, but again, 
my parents wanted to do something good for someone else. So after several visits and much discussion, we made one final trip to bring Anne home. She came with one small suitcase containing all her belongings. And when we, got my, when we got home, my mom unpacked the few things in it and tucked the suitcase under the bed in my parents' room. This is where our few pieces of luggage went. We had very few occasions to use them since we rarely traveled. My dad was a postal worker and my mom stayed home. So we had no extra money for lavish or even not so lavish vacations. Now we suspected that Anne had been damaged from her time in foster care. We found out later that her 16-year-old white mom had given her up for adoption a dozen times and then changed her mind. So Anne had been ping-ponged back and forth more in her first three years than most kids are in a lifetime. Her dad, a black man who had fathered several other kids with different moms, was not in the picture. And when Anne first came to us, she spent the first several weeks coloring scribbles with nothing but black crayons. Now one night, <clears throat> my friend had asked me to sleep over, so I thought that I could use Anne's tiny suitcase. I got it out from under the bed, um, and Anne saw me. She stood there and she asked, am I leaving again? When she saw the suitcase, she knew it was time for her to go yet again. Even at 13, as self-absorbed as I was, I knew that this was heartbreaking. I explained I was just going to use it for a sleepover with a friend, and she wasn't going anywhere. She didn't show any emotion. Just stoic acceptance and a nod. She went back to scribbling with her black crayon. I'd love to say that the rest of her life was amazing, and this adoption transformed her, and you know maybe it did a little. She was safe and fed and had a roof over her head. My sisters and I <laughs> included her in playing, introduced her around the neighborhood, and eventually she got more comfortable. But as an adult, I looked back and I saw that we as a family had systematically erased her blackness without even knowing it. She was part of our family, but when we went shopping, people never hesitated to frown at my mom and ask why she had that N-word baby in the stroller. Well, there was no good reply. In 1970s Ohio, <laughs> my 13-year-old self was not about to speak up. And although it angered my mom, she didn't want to cause a fight in a shopping mall, so she usually just ignored the comments and walked on, smiling as if she hadn't heard. But we heard, and so did Anne. We never talked about her blackness. We assimilated her into our family, thinking that was the kind thing to do. I am sure my parents thought so. Doing that and trying to make her one of us, we erased who she had been. We denied her heritage. We expected her to behave like us, to like the things that we liked, to eat the things that we ate. My other age sisters and I were very musical, and we liked reading, and did not like those things. She found great success in sports, whereas none of the rest of us kids had any, I mean any, athletic ability. <laughs> We were really good at school, we got really good grades, Anne was not and didn't. And I'm sure being the fourth kid in a line of star students was not an easy thing to deal with. We were all people pleasers and she was not. Instead of seeing these things as perhaps, perhaps inevitable differences, my parents saw them as traits to be smoothed out and hidden. Conformity was important. As she got older, this became more of a point of friction. Anne liked music that none of the rest of us liked. She started to hang out with black kids at school. And it felt dangerous to my parents because from what they could see, the black kids got in trouble. When a white kid smoked in a bathroom, they needed counseling. When a black kid did it, they got suspended. When a white kid skipped class, 
they got to talk with the principal and then were sent back to class. When a black kid skipped class, they were suspended. Look at these statistics from 2015, and you can see that not much has really changed. When she was a teenager, she wanted to know about her birth parents, and did, and my mom was terribly insulted. She felt like she'd sacrificed a lot of her life to save Anne, and that the desire to find her birth parents was a slap in the face. Anne fought with them more and more and rebelled at their need for her to be like the rest of us. <laughs> they tried in their way to get help. A social worker came calling once every six months, but there was really no counseling or race awareness or sensitivity training in the 70s in Ohio. As we became adults, it was clear from the way my other two sisters talked that they thought any of the problems that Anne had were directly caused by her blackness. She got into debt. She bought stuff she couldn't afford, like brand new cars and expensive shoes. She quit jobs regularly and moved frequently. And all of these things were implicitly caused by her blackness, but the commentary was very subtle. This is the under the radar racism that was endemic to where I grew up. For example, there were these knowing sighs and the shaking of heads when the topic of Anne came up. Well, you know how she is about money, one sister would say, rolling her eyes. She wouldn't listen to me. Or, well, she just had to go and buy that ridiculous fur coat. She couldn't afford it. It's so ghetto, said another. Well, when you have a couple of baby daddies, that's what's going to happen. When her second son was born from a different man from the first. The assumptions became the beliefs that became the truth. If I expressed an opinion about Anne's situation that was counter to my sister's observation, I just didn't understand, because I had moved to California at 23. You know, the land of fruits and nuts. <laughs> they told me Anne had been in a small traffic accident, and she was fine, and immediately they chalked it up to her being careless. And when I said, well, um, didn't you also get in a fender bender on the freeway when you started to drive in Columbus? The subject was changed. Did I push it? Did I insist on this discussion? No, I did not. My family was all about keeping things polite, not making waves, and my opinion had lost all consideration because I left. As the Black Lives Matter protests grew and spread, I saw the adoption of my sister through a different lens. All the well-meaning neighbors who had adopted biracial kids in my parents' friend group were doing it for noble reasons, but then they failed those kids by not honoring their heritage or their ancestry. We tried to erase who they were, not purposefully, but by well-intentioned neglect. We wanted them to be us because being us was the way to be successful. Being the other led to drug addiction, poverty, crime, violence. It was a misbegotten but well-intentioned thing, but it was wrong at the root. I realized that my family and I were some of those good-hearted white folks. I called my sister, who now lives in Arizona, and I told her this. I told her that finally I saw and acknowledged the subtle and not so subtle racism that she'd been subjected to in our house, in our town, in our school, in our state. I told her I hadn't seen all of it at the time, and now I was beginning, beginning to understand. I wanted to apologize, to take it back, to do it over, but of course, that's not possible. We cried together over the phone. Then she started to share photos with me, photos of her birth family, to whom she had connected when she became an adult. She had several sisters, a brother, a mom and a dad who are now old and changed over time as we all do. She shared this part of her life with me, 
a part we as a family in the 70s had never even acknowledged or considered. I hope that we've made something of a bridge to start forging a real relationship. And I hope she's forgiven us for the mistakes we made with good intentions. I worry for her two sons going out in this world as black men. I think of all the things that happened in the past and how most of them were meant as kindness but were, were tinged with ignorance. I know now that none of these questions about race are simple black and white. And I'm grateful that I finally saw it and talked about it with my sister, Anne. Thank you. Give it up for Laura Preble.